Well, we're going to do this as a sort of TV chat, chat show, but, but, the, but the first speaker is Bill, who is going to give a 15 minutes. I don't know how, many, how many of you have read his book? And the rest of you are going to read it very soon, aren't you? Oh, so kind, so kind. Thank you. I will tell you. There's two strange things about this book. One is it's utterly readable, because it's a bit like a novel. And secondly, it hasn't got a copyright notice. <laughs> right, right. So actually, Why is that, Bill? Right, so I, ha I, I had a discussion with Oxford about this. And, and Oxford has typically a really tough, long copyright notice that says, essentially, you can't do anything without express written permission. So I didn't agree with that. Because uh, I want people to do things. So it was actually a very easy negotiation. I said, look, you know, if you leave that notice on, it's going to be really contrary to most of the stuff that's in the book. So would you please take it off? And they said, okay, but can we leave the trademark stuff on? I said, I don't care about trademark law. I'm a copyright lawyer. You know, go do what you want to. You know, it's your trademark, not mine. So there's no notice on there. Now, that's why. But it, it went from a notice that was really draconian. Yeah. To nothing. Well, I mean, let's get going. There you go. You've got a few things to say at the beginning, and then we're going to, I'm going to fire a few questions from time to time. Oh, okay. Great. So I, I want to thank Sir Robin for hosting this. And uh, the last time I saw him was when our, our friend Sir Hugh Laddy was still alive, and you, you were on the appellate bench. Um, I believe, and uh, you know, it's it's very sad that he wasn't with us. But I learned a tremendous amount from him, and he was really an extraordinary person. So it's, it's quite fitting that both of you, having a long history of uh, engaging, as I understand, in mischievous stuff um, when you when you were in private practice, that that you're now uh, here as the first Hugh Laddie. Uh, chair, and uh, I'm sure you know he's going to be chomping at the bit, and that we'll learn uh, a great deal from his experience being on the bench and his own interesting views on the role of evidence uh, in copyright. So at least so we do some sort of consumer stuff. If you came to a lecture about what would you know leadership and copyright look like, we should probably talk about that for a little bit, and then Sir Sir Robin will lead the uh, the discussion where he'd like it to go. So I, I can give you some experience from my own perspective in the United States because um, I was involved in uh, our Congress. I worked for our Congress for seven, seven years in the legislative branch altogether. And there, there's sort of a practice in the United States. If you're a witness and you're appearing before our Congress, the sort of unspoken rules that you always think the chair of the committee for his or her leadership. Even if it's a bill that you hate and that's going to put you out of business, you know, you thank him or her for their leadership. Um, and then when a bill goes to the floor of the House, it's sort of the uh, practice there for other members of Congress to thank the chair for his or her leadership in doing this. You know, there are 435 members of the House of Representatives. Um, and you'd think if you were on the floor, that's a lot of people to, to, to thank. But as it turns out, in copyright legislation, there are only typically two members who vote on this. You know, if you, if you look at proceedings of that, there's the, the chair who is sponsoring, and then there's the, what we call the ranking minority member, who is the member of the other party. Um, right now, it happens to be the Democrats that are in the minority. When I was there, it was the Republicans who were in the minority. But it was only those two who were there. Now, occasionally, there'd be another member there because they would have their own bill that was going to be there next. And there was one occasion where we had a copper bill like that. Um, I was sitting with my boss, who was the chair of the subcommittee, and Barney Frank was like the third member there. You know, got this big chamber. If you've ever seen the State of the Union address, it's, you know, it's a rather large chamber. It can fit all the members and then the Senate and those members of the Supreme Court who are still coming to hear those things. Um, but we're sitting there as three people. So Barney Frank is not known for his great patience, known you know, for many things, being very witty and very smart, but he's not a very patient guy. So he's sitting there, and it's his turn, and he sort of lets you know that he's impatient and, and fidgety. So my boss, you know, sort of going to prank him. So he gets up there, and he starts thanking 
lots of different people for their leadership. And Barney sort of you know, gets that what he's actually doing is stalling so that Barney doesn't get a chance to have his bill up. And so he asked to be recognized. And then, of course, he thanked my boss, Mr. Hughes, for his great leadership. And he said he'd like to thank the only other two people in the entire city of Washington, D.C., who hadn't been thanked yet. And having done that, could we please get on and you know, pass our bill so he could get his up? So when I'm talking about leadership, I'm not really talking about that kind of leadership, the sort of formulaic thing where you routinely thank people for it. Um, I, in, in figuring out what leadership might be like, I, I brought along a book that I've shown some of you, uh, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about how to obey copyright law. I had another one, and I can't find it, and it sort of annoys me. It's from 1985, and it's called Tribes on the Hill, and it's by an anthropologist. His name is Jack Rutherford, and what he decided to do to figure out how Congress makes laws is to treat them not as a political scientist would, using political theory, but rather to treat them like an anthropologist would, and so study them as if they were African tribes, which is why it's called Tribes on the Hill. And it's a very funny, very insightful way of looking at it, um, and I leave it to you to make your own anthropological <laughs> sort of approaches to how you would view your leaders. Uh, and I want to, I, in, in speaking about ours, because that, that's where my, my knowledge is, uh, I, I want to note some of the differences, right? If we're trying to figure out what leadership is, you have to figure out the environment in which leaders act. And so our situation is really rather different from yours. One of the big differences is that we have a non-parliamentary independent Congress, right? So our Congress is elected independent of party, meaning that every single person is elected individually, um, and they answer ostensibly only to their own uh, constituencies. Right? One of the unusual things about copyright and intellectual property generally um, is that our executive branch, the president, the, you know, the various what you would call ministries, aren't involved in making policy at all. I was in Washington for 13 years, and in that 13 years, the executive branch only played a role in two pieces of legislation. One of them was the GATT agreement, in which the copyright parts were trips. I know Sir Robin has some views on that. The other one was the Berne Convention and our decision to join the Berne Convention. Both of those involved foreign affairs. So that's you know, rather peculiarly something that executive branch gets involved in. Um, but that was it. The entire time that uh, we were involved in drafting stuff when I was there, we never even consulted you know, with the president or the executive branch at all. Why would we? You know, they, they weren't leaders in this. They had no role to play in the development of copyright policy other than signing a bill once it was done. And, and that, I think, is a different situation. The only exception to that, and that was a very recent exception, of course, is our SOPA legislation that was very controversial, and the, the beginning of the end, if not the end itself, was signaled when the Obama administration indicated that they couldn't support it. And, and that, was, that was a stunning development for the executive to actually get involved in the legislative process in intellectual property. So that, that's, I think, a rather different situation. So the way it usually works is that it's the chairs of the committees in the case of copyright, it's usually the Judiciary Committees that are involved in, in making policy. The, the President, unlike the situation in parliamentary systems, can't even introduce a bill. Right? If Obama wants to introduce a bill, he can't do it himself. None of the ministers can do it. The ministers never testify on these things. It's only the members of Congress who get to introduce these things. And our committees are divided, of course, by jurisdictions. And it's the judiciary committees that generally deal with copyright issues. And, and so that's where the, the power resides. And that's where the opportunity to lead really uh, resides. Now, the, the, the committee chairs, of course, since they're divided by jurisdictions, are, reg are regularly regulating particular industries 
and they're repeat industries, right? If you're reg regulating, uh, say, telecommunications, it's the same group of people generally who are there before you. There can be different issues and different players and stuff like that, but there, there are repeat people. Now, in the House of Representatives, they're elected for two years, uh, and, and the fundraising requirements for them are really stiff. They're out raising money all the time. So the question is, who do you raise money from? Now, if you're a committee chair, there is an opportunity, of course, to raise money from the people who are doing business with you. Um, and we, we have rules on this, and it's not the least bit uncommon for committee chairs to raise more money from lobbyists and from people outside of their districts <coughs> than they do their own constituencies. And remember that we don't have really a, a party system on these things at all, so you're not getting funding from, from the party either. And that leads to certain dynamics. It leads at least to the potential for what we would call regulatory capture, right? A situation where the regulators are actually heavily influenced by those who are supposed to be regulating because it's where you, know, you actually get the money from. Now, since there are different committees that deal with different sort of issues, you have the potential for conflicts. And you know, if, if you agree with the idea of regulatory capture, um, that doesn't, that's not a complete answer because there are different committees and they have their own form of regulatory capture. So I'll give you a concrete example uh, of this. When we were debating what became the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, and this is a process that took place over a number of years. We passed it in 1998. Uh, it has not, yeah, yes, 1998, after the 1996 WIPO uh, treaties on this. The bill was actually, the origins of this are sort of interesting. So this was an example of where the executive branch wanted to play some role. In this case, it was the, it was the patent office. There was a fellow, uh, Bruce Lehman, who had been the actual uh, chief counsel for the House Judiciary Committee. And, and then his boss got defeated. He went into private practice, uh, made some money, and then decided he wanted to go back into government. And he was a friend of Bill, Bill being Bill Clinton here, and, and got appointed to being the, the commissioner of patents. But his real interest was copyright law, not particularly patent law. And not surprisingly, his relations with some of the patent bar wasn't always great, especially the small inventors. So he wanted to make copyright policy. Um, he came to me and my boss in 1994 and had a green paper, right? The green paper comes before the white paper, and the white paper comes before the legislation. And, and so he had this green paper for this whole thing. We thought it was ridiculous, and you know, that, that was sort of the end of it. Because, as I mentioned, while he wanted to make copyright policy, the actual policy making is in the legislature, so we were free to say to the executive branch, you know, thanks, but no thanks, and you know, they go out the door and you throw it in the trash. And that, that's the end of it. So, you know, you, the, where the power resides in this area is rather important. Democrats lose the election in 1994, goes Republican, and wow, a white paper comes out, and the, and the new Republicans introduce verbatim what he had asked, like not a change, not even a comma, no punctuation, which shows you that you know, copyright is nonpartisan. I mean, here was a Democrat coming to Democrats in 1994, and we said, that's really a bad idea. It leaves the door, we throw it in the trash. We lose the election, 1995, a, a Democrat goes to Republicans, and they say, yeah, yeah, we'll do that. <laughs> so it was introduced. Then uh, it couldn't get passed because there was a dispute, he went to WIPO, WIPO treaties come about, you come back and you say, hey, we signed this treaty, now we have obligations to do this. It's sort of a backdoor way to make policy because the Congress still has to do it, but then you have the pressure of, wow, since the executive only makes the trade agreements and treaties, you sign a treaty that obligates you to change your law, except it's only Congress can change the law. And, and that sets up sort of a poisonous dynamic which took place in ACTA. I mean, there's lots of disputes in the United States about ACTA and the role of USTR in, in doing this, which we can get into if you want to. Nevertheless, the power dynamic here, the potential leadership dynamic, was the executive going over and signing a treaty, which they're entitled to do and the only ones who can do it, 
then coming back to Congress and saying, now you have to pass this legislation you didn't pass before, because if you don't, it's really embarrassing to sign a treaty and be out of compliance with it. Right? Now, that didn't answer the other dynamic. So the dynamic is this. The judiciary committees which regulate the copyright industries generally are very pro-copyright industries. We have commerce committees which regulate the uh, telecommunications industry that are, not surprisingly, generally very favorable towards the telecommunications companies. The judiciary committees wanted to have strict liability and no safe harbors at all for intermediaries. The commerce committees didn't want to have the le legislation at all, but if you're going to have it, you had to have safe harbors. So you had a conflict between these two committees. Now, because it's much easier to defeat legislation than it is to pass it, the commerce committees prevailed, and that's why we have safe harbors um, in, in U.S. law, because of the conflict between uh, different situations, and diff different people who, who had different starting points. Now, in a parliamentary system, that really doesn't occur, at least when you have a majority um, in your parliament. Canada now has a majority parliament. It didn't have one for some time. It had a minority government. Um, and that caused differences because the, 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 uh, the, the conservative party there wanted to pass copyright reform, but it didn't have the votes to do it on its own. And when the government fell, of course, the reform legislation fell. Currently, there is a, ma a majority government, and the majority ha party uh, has indicated that they want to pass copyright legislation, and they will. There were issues about hearings and stuff, and they said, look, we've talked this thing to death. We're going to pass this thing. Now, in that situation, there's an opportunity, I think, for real leadership. You know, we, we have issues in the United States where we elect a president based upon a platform. The, president, the person who's running say, well, this is what I'm going to accomplish, right? Vote for me as your leader because this is what I want to do. Except we have an independent Congress. And those Congress could, of course, be from different parties. So the ability of anybody running for president in the United States to actually make, come to pass, those things that they want is very, very small. You get into difficulties where you want to take credit for things that you probably can't take credit for and you don't want to take blame for other things. But the difference between that and the parliamentary system where you have a majority government is that you can actually do it. So if you vote for somebody, there's a chance for leadership there, which is that the, the, you, the government actually enacts the policy that it ran on, you know, assuming it does that. That is actually, I think, an opportunity to show leadership, where people can say, this is what I want our leaders to do. Majority government, you can do what you want. And you say to the minority, well, you know, you lost the election. <laughs> we had that sometimes in the United States where we say, you know, well, you lost the election, but, but you, you can't actually do it. In, in your, your systems, you can. That's, you know, a, a different sort of opportunity for people to be leaders. Now, I'm not actually conflating power with leadership, because you can have people who have power who aren't leaders. You might say, for example, that Bashar al-Assad um, is somebody who has power but may not be a particular leader. I think you can also have a situation where you have followers but no leaders, right? like in a cult situation. You have someone who you think is really a leader but, but is really a cult. And we had, I think, an example of that in the United States of like a copyright cult where there was lots of people who were following and it's questionable whether the cult leader uh, was, was actually the leader. So what do I mean by a leader then? Right? What I mean by a leader, I think, is somebody who can effectuate change and who does it not out of personal gain, or at least not wholly out of personal gain. If you're doing it for personal gain, it's hard to say you're leading anybody else. Right? You're just sort of making come true what you want to come true for your own purposes. And I would go further and say that my, my ideal leader would be somebody who would take positions and try and do things, even if it resulted in an electoral loss. You would say, well, you elected me to do something, and maybe you know it's unpopular, but I'm going to do it. If you want to vote me out, vote me out. We had an example of that, actually, in the New York State Legislature, 
when they had a debate about same-sex marriage in Albany, and Albany being the capital of, of New York. And this one conservative Republican said, you know, I'm actually sick of all this. I'm going to vote for this, and if you don't like it, that's too bad. Go ahead in the next election and vote me out. That, that's an example of somebody who did something and who was willing to sacrifice their electoral position uh, for something. Now, under that definition, it may be we have very few leaders. Right? We have very few people who are willing to do that um, if you buy into the idea that the first rule of politics is survival. And, you know, people can rationalize that. Well, you know, if, if I don't, you know, if you don't elect me to do this, the guy who is going to come later or the, or the woman who comes later is going to be worse than me. Right? We all can rationalize decisions that we do, that we're actually the best person out there, even if what we're doing is for our own benefit, because the other person is actually worse. Now, when I worked for Congress, my boss actually faced a situation like that. We had a bill that we had developed and pushed uh, for two years. It was a bill on giving sound recordings a performance right. It was a very limited right. And we tried to get that through, and the broadcasters, who have tremendous power in the United States, were vehemently opposed to that. And we tried to compromise with them. Um, I've had discussions with people about how you deal with people who won't compromise. And so if they have power, it's sort of hard to compromise with them because they don't have to. And the broadcasters, of course, know they don't have to compromise on this, and they didn't. And we tried to do everything conceivable to, to get them to buy in. You know, we changed the law in ways so that almost that would never affect them. They still didn't care. So the bill got to the point where to give the broadcasters what they wanted to go away would have taken away the things that made the bill attractive in the first place. So my boss said, you know, that, that's it. I'm not going to, to push this any further because the bill I would have to push would be something I wouldn't be proud of. Now, those people who wanted the bill passed actually came in and they said, and my boss at this point, by the way, had announced he was retiring, so he wasn't going to run next time. And the bill, if it was going to be passed, you know, was either going to be passed then or they'd have to start over again. So they said to him, look, we know this is a lousy bill. We know this is probably the best bill we can get now and it's not what we wanted and we're really upset about it. But if you don't do it now, the next bill is going to be even worse, right? And my boss said, well, you know, that's your problem. You know, it's my bill and it's not something I'm proud of. So he didn't do it. So those things occur, but, but they're fairly rare. So you might think, well, that's actually unrealistic. You know, you work for a great guy, and I did, and those people are sort of, of unusual. So maybe we have a slightly more realistic different, a different definition of it. So maybe a different definition of who a leader is is somebody who's first willing to be educated, because one of the things about members of parliament are that they're generalists. And this is true for many judges. Certainly in the United States, our federal judges are generalists. So you can't know everything about everything. If you're there long enough, you might develop specialties, as indeed Sir, Sir Robin did um, develop a specialty and became a great, a great specialist in the area. But most judges don't. They hear criminal cases, they hear civil cases in the United States. Criminal cases, civil cases, um, they even can hear fender bender cases if there's you know, diversity of jurisdiction. You don't have a lot of opportunity, so you have to rely on other people to educate you, and members of Congress are that way too. And there's no shame in that. There's no shame in not knowing everything. Um, long ago I gave up the sort of idea that I should be an expert on everything or even have an opinion on everything. Right? You, you need to get educated on things. So the first thing I would say is that someone who's in a leadership position should be willing to be educated. I would say it would also be somebody who's willing to base their opinion on evidence, wherever that may take them. I'd say it would be someone who's willing to educate others, someone who sort of inspires confidence that you believe that they're actually leading, right? And someone who's actually willing maybe to take positions that are unpopular. So maybe you think that's as unreasonable a view as somebody who's willing to sacrifice their electoral thing. But I, I would ask this, which is, if that's not what you want leaders to be, 
then why are we seemingly always disappointed? <laughs> you elect people and you think they're going to do things and then you're disappointed in them. You're disappointed in them, I think, because you actually expected them to do something different. Usually people aren't disappointed if people act in the way they expect them to act. You may not like it, but you're not disappointed. You're only disappointed when you have different expectations. So if someone's in a leadership position, you expect them to have certain qualities. Now, in terms of copyright, uh, I gave a talk last night at the London School of Economics on what an evidence-based copyright law might look at. And in that talk, I, I mentioned the importance of having laws that people obey. And what we've had, I think, in copyright is an amazing focus for a long time on what we do about people who disobey the law, right? It's enforcement, enforcement, enforcement. And you hear people, for example, in the United States say, like our Register of Copyrights did, well, I have to start with enforcement because if we don't have enforcement, we don't have exclusive rights that matter, and then the whole system fails. Right? So everything seems to be based upon uh, enforcement. And my own belief is that if you start with enforcement and the focus is on enforcement, that's a sign of failed leadership, both at the business level and at the leadership level, the political level. And I say it's a failure because I, I, my, my assumption here is that the laws don't match societal values. So you can either start from the opinion that most people don't care about laws and are quasi-criminals, or criminals if they have the opportunity, you know, or you can start from the premise that most people will obey most laws. And, you know, I, at least being something of an optimist, I'd like to think that most people are willing to obey most laws. So this book that I have, that I showed you before, is, is called Why People Obey the Law. And I think the focus has to be on figuring out as a leader, as a political leader, how you can have laws that people are going to want to obey. Right? So you could force people to obey laws, but you can't do that all the time. It's sort of hard, even with visible stuff. Right? In New York City, where there's a fair amount of crime, you could have an amazing number of police who are in areas where there's a lot of crime. But you can't have police everywhere. Right? If you're interested in drunk driving, this is one of the things the book talks about, you can set up roadblocks and you're going to stop people at those roadblocks and then, you know, most people, unless they're incredibly drunk when they get to the roadblock, right, aren't going to go there. You're going to know that there's these things there. But you can't have roadblocks on every road all the time. So to get people to obey laws, you have to figure out some different thing. And certainly for copyright, which occurs most infringement, which mostly occurs in private, you are of necessity forced to rely on people's willingness to obey laws because you simply can't catch them in flagrante delicto, right? You, you can't do it. And if there's a lot of people engaging in this private activity as there is, that's a real issue. So the first thing I think that leaders have to do, what leadership would represent to me, would figure out a way to have laws that people will obey. And the only way to do that, I think, is to have laws that most people agree match the way they want to behave. It's really hard, I think, to get people to, masses of people to obey laws they don't agree with, right? God and Moses tried that at Mount Sinai, and, you know, that sort of top-down approach didn't work for them. There was a little problem with the golden calf and being impatient, and, you know, stuff like that. The sort of top-down approach of enforcement first has never worked, which is why, the, you know, the Israelites had to wander around the desert for 40 years and, you know, stuff like that. And, you know, the belief was that though they were so contaminated, they'd never obey the law, so that's why they had to wander around for a generation until those, those particular people died off. Um, so you have to figure out laws that people are going to be willing to obey. Now, of course, there's differences of opinion about what laws would be. We have pluralistic societies in which some people think this is fair and other people think it's not fair, right? So in, in any heterogeneous society, you're going to have differences of opinion on that. So you have to figure out some other way to do it. 
It is true, as Tom Tyler said, that people may obey laws they don't agree with if they believe either that it was sort of a close call or that people have difference of opinion, but they're good natured, you know, you know, there are two sides to every story as the metaphor goes, and that the person who decides what it is is fair in some way. And, and so the other thing that he points out is that the process by which laws are made has to be a fair process. It has to be an opportunity for people to participate. Because if people are free to participate and they do, they have sort of bought into agreeing with what the end result is. And so one of the forms of leadership that I think is really important, where in fact you have a genuine opportunity to lead, is where you can pass laws that some amount of people will not agree with, but they'll obey it anyway, because they had the opportunity to come to you and have their say. What happened in SOPA and what happened in ACTA is the opposite of that. Right? The ACTA negotiations were all done in secret. Even members of parliaments couldn't see what it was. It was sort of the United States, oh, you know, trust us. It's not going to change U.S. law. And the EU said, trust us. It's not going to change EU law. You know, well, who's it for? <laughs> if no one's going to change the law, you know, why, why have this thing? Um, and that was very contentious, and it led, of course, some members of the EU delegation to constantly leak things, uh, which wasn't so great either. In our SOPA legislation, the belief was that it was a very unpopular law, and members of Congress didn't want to be educated. If you recall, remember I said before that a first, to me, a, a first attribute of a leader is someone who's willing to be educated. So there was controversy about what the effect of that legislation was, you know, and whether it would, it would break the internet is the metaphor for it. You know, that was an inaccurate metaphor, but it would seriously impede, according to some people, the operation of the domain name system, and it would lead to things. So you figure that out. You figure, will it actually do it? If, if you're a responsible leader, you will go talk to the people who actually know this and then try and figure it out for yourself. So engineers were actually offered up to the committees and they said no. You know, we, don't want, we don't want them as witnesses. We want other people, essentially sacrificial lambs. And you know, at that point you sort of decide, wow, this is not really a fair process. You know, it's not a process where the people want to be educated, where they're going to have hearings, where everybody praises you for your leadership, which is what occurs. And the people who are praising you, of course, are the people who lobbied you in the first place. It's really easy to praise someone for their leadership when they're doing what you ask them to do. It's a little harder when they're doing something that you may not particularly um, agree with. So our legislation was unique because it, it got that close to being legislation that was passed that a huge number of people didn't agree with. And then the question comes, if you go ahead and do that, if you actually roll people, you know, in, in the American colloquialism of go over them, notwithstanding their agreements, are they actually going to obey the law? You know, sometimes getting what you want isn't really the best thing for you. So um, I'll, I'll, I'll stop there and maybe that is sufficient for the truth in advertising uh, about what the title was. And, and the other thing I would finally say in conclusion is about the evidence-based part of that. Um, in the SOPA legislation, you had the perfect example of a law that wasn't going to be based on evidence because the people who were passing it had no interest in it being based on evidence. And, you know, people exercised political uh, involvement and maybe there were some politicians who were influenced by the evidence-based nature of it or maybe others were worried about being re-elected since a lot of the sponsors who bailed out were people who were running for re-election on that particular cycle. But I, I absolutely want to praise as strongly as I can the process that has occurred in the UK with the Hargreaves review and with the IPO's uh, impact assessments. We have nothing remotely close to that uh, in the United States. And, and to me, that's a sign of real leadership when you have a willingness to base things on evidence and you have impact assessments and you can talk about whether the evidence says this or that. That's a huge step forward and we're very far 
uh, behind you in that, and I'm incredibly jealous of you. <laughs> well, the UK has done it, but the European Union hasn't. Uh, European Union copyright legislation emerges uh, from a very untransparent process. Uh, and the more you see the way that European directives are created from the inside, the more depressed you get. Maybe it's always true. The more you know about lawmaking, the less happy you are about the way it's done. I want to ask you about evidence-based. What do you understand by evidence-based? What is evidence in this area? Right. So it would depend upon what the particular subject is. And I, and I know you have particular views about parody as one where you may or may not need an evidence-based uh, approach. So we, we can take a particular issue. So we'll take term extension because it's the easiest and everyone knows what it is and it's quite easy to figure out. So if you say the purpose of legislation is to increase the amount of works that are going to be created, right? that, that's why you're doing this. And, and presumably legislatures aren't involved in ideological or religious sort of legislating. They're problem solving things. right? You want legislatures to solve real problems. Um, you know, I, I certainly understand that in the real world of legislatures, sometimes things are done for religious reasons or ideological reasons. But in an area of copyright that's economic legislation, um, one would hope that the legislation is there to solve actual problems. So you would say, in terms of how long copyright should last, that the purpose is to increase the supply of copyrighted works. At least take that as, as an opening sort of theory. That's why we want to do it, because we think that copyright is a, is a but-for situation where but-for copyright, the supply of copyrighted works would be suboptimal. Right? There would still be a lot of works that are created because people create a lot of stuff for non-economic reasons. And, and that's more true now than it ever was. They you know, create works that are, that are blogs, or <laughs> given the you know, amazing scope of copyright protection to being almost everything under the sun, all of us create you know, dozens of copyright works every day. Sort of what, what Jimmy Stewart said, that he hadn't realized he'd been creating prose his whole life. Um, so, you know, we all create copyright works. Yeah, it's an interesting thing, isn't it, copyright? Has it ever occurred to anybody that there's an awful lot of copyrights out there when nobody knows what they are anymore? They're like sort of Cheshire cats. There's just the grin left, the copyright, but the work itself has disappeared. Every business letter that's ever been written in the last hundred years is a copyright work. We have all the letters. It's an extraordinary fact there's are copyrights floating in the air and nobody knows they're there. Right, so <laughs> un under, under my approach of an evidence-based one, there would be no copyright for business letters because there's no necessity to provide an incentive for them. <coughs> People write business letters for business reasons. They don't write business letters because they want to exploit them in a, in a commercial way. And as a society, if your goal is to encourage the creation of creative, inventive, fanciful works, business documents don't go that way. Um, I, you, know, you might also include, include crown copyright in that as well. We, we don't have copyright for works of government in the United States. We regard it as sort of double taxation. Um, but you know, you, governments do things for good government reasons um, and you know, the sort of idea on uh, owning copyright in them you know, doesn't make sense. But for those sort of works where the but for is possible, you would say but for copyright the amount of works we have is less than what we want, so therefore we need to have more copyright. If we have more copyright, we're going to have more works. Right? So if that's sort of the, the intellectual exercise. And so how would that work out for an evidence-based approach? Right? You would want to figure out if indeed you have a longer term of copyright, would there be more works? If the answer is no, then you shouldn't do it. You shouldn't do it because you're not increasing the supply. 
So you can, you, I, this is something I think you can figure out. Yeah, but do you, can you do it by evidence? I mean, it's fairly self-evident that increasing the term from 50 to 70 years is not going to create any new works that wouldn't have been created uh, if it was only 50 years. And, and, and if you were going to try and get evidence, how would you actually get it? Right, so one way <laughs> you... You go around and ask people, would you write this if, you, if, if it was only 50 years? Or no, no, I wouldn't do it then. But, but 70 years, I'd do it. Yeah, right. I, mean, I, I read sort of self-evident <laughs> in the evidentiary sense. So to take this up, you would have somebody who's 30 years old and will say their average life expectancy is 80, so they have 50 more years to live, and then the term of copyright is 50 years beyond that, so that's 100 years. So under this but-for theory, you would say, well, look, present now, present value, that person is not going to create the work because the term of copyright is not long enough. If we give them 20 years, if we give them a 120-year term of copyright, if we give them 70 years after they're dead, they're going to do that rather than something else. Right? Now, from the self-evidentiary standpoint you're talking about, um, that might be all you need. But of course, it's not actually as self-evident as you think because it's, it's, it's based upon your life experience of how people actually work. But we don't have to rely upon that. You can rely upon, upon data like books and print. How many books were created in this year? And 50 years or 60 years or 70 years after that, how many of those books are still in print? And you would say that if a book is, is still in print, it has economic value. You, you can figure that out. And in the United States, we had an additional data point for evidence. And that was our requirement of renewal, where until 1978 you had to renew your work 28 years after you first got. We of course copied this from you. We copied everything from you. You happened to have abandoned it, but you know, maybe being non-creative, we held on to it long after you got rid of it. And indeed, we loved it so much we made it even stronger than you ever did. Right? You never, I think, had a notice requirement. Um, you started out with 14 plus 14 years, perhaps based on apprenticeships. We, we held on to that after you did. So our term was 28 years, and if you wanted 28 more years, you had to tell the government you wanted it. You paid them three bucks, and you filed a form. So you would think that after 28 years, most people would say, yeah, I want another 28 years of copyright. But the data, which is consistent over 100 years, was to the contrary. It showed that on average only 15% of people renew. And it showed for books it was 7%, for motion pictures it was 74%, for oral sermons it was 33%, and you can sort of work it out. And, and that, I think, is evidence. It's evidence based upon actual market signals of what the commercial value of those works is. And the beauty of it is it's actually based upon the actions by people themselves who benefit from it. I don't have to guess how many books were renewed and what the value of it was because the people who owned it did it by their own actions. And you could do this work by work. And that, I think, is actually an evidence-based form. You would say, for most books, that 93% of them, the 28 years was quite long enough. Why would you give books a longer term of protection then 28 years, if for 93% of the people that was really quite enough. You know, the sort of social surplus thing is tilted quite the other way. That, that's actually one way you could do it. Well, I see that as a sort of incidental bit of evidence of the registration system, but the sort of most of the questions that people are asking, the patent officer are asking now, on evidence-based, are not that sort of question at all, where you can actually go and look at any statistics. You've just got to go out and ask people. There isn't any evidence. You well, look at books in print. Uh, so uh, Hargraves and, and Gowers both, I think, did a good job of going to like the BBC and others and saying, what do you have in your archives and what's the cost for you of being able that, that, that to I make see, that available? That, that I mean, if right? this is the kind of level of evidence we're talking about, yes. it's, it's a pretty crude evidence, isn't it? But what would you require? I mean, you were a judge, so if, if I, I came before you and I gave the evidence I just gave you of renewal and archives and things like that, what would your answer be? 
Uh, without that, that you're not used to people asking you questions, right? <laughs> yeah. The other way around. They're very true. Uh, they, they, I, mean, I, I, I think, insofar, I mean, the BBC's problem is a very self-evident problem. It's not hard. It's hardly evidence, in 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 in, in, in the sense of what are we going to do about it? You know, the, the, uh, it. It's obvious that if you have thousands of works in copyright, all of which are either orphan or near orphan. Um, you know, the distant relative somewhere inherited it somewhere. Um, you are going to have huge problems in in using archives of any kind. Uh, uh, it's a self-evident problem. You hardly need evidence for it. What you can say is, from that self-evident position, if you like, which I've used the word evidence in a different way, self-evident. Um, You've got to do something about it if you're being a rational, cop copying, creating rational copyright law. Right. So I would, I would take issue with the way you're using the word self-evident. For me, my perception of the way you use that is that you actually agree with the evidence, that the evidence makes sense to you, and therefore it's self-evident to you. Well, <laughs> the economist, I think, means something much, much more precise. And much more, and I think Hargreaves did that. In many cases, they had in mind something much more precise that you could actually formulate a policy by going out and collecting detailed evidence of some kind or other which they don't specify, which would enable you to come up with some sort of much more refined copyright law. I don't believe that. Mm -hmm. So, what about books and print? Let's say we're going to try to figure out what the commercial life is for most books. If that's the task. Now maybe you can say it's an impossible task to do and there's no evidence that's actually going to persuade you of that. But, but why wouldn't data on how many books remain in print after a certain period of time be a I form think that's of entirely persuasive. But oh, I mean, okay. it's not very surprising. Data, okay, I'll stop it? there then. <laughs> it's not very surprising. <laughs> <data>. <laughs> You've persuaded the judge, you sit down and shut up, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, what are we going to do about it? I mean, we, let's, 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 let right. me ask a different question now. He's, he's written this book, How to Fix Copyright, and one of the things he says at the beginning is, I don't actually tell you. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, first of all, that, that was my publisher's title, not mine. But what, what I said is that I wasn't going to have, as my publisher wanted, a f chapter which like lists, yes. these are my recommendations, one to ten. And the reason I didn't do that, um, well, there's two reasons. First of all, I was too tired of, <laughs> after writing it to do something like that. But the, the other reason was, it didn't make sense to me. If, if, if the arguments are based upon the evidence and context and persuading people and not persuading people, just seeing, oh, well, you know, you should have a renewal requirement, that, that's, that's not really the best way in which you want people to, to do that. So that, that's why, you know, I, w I would like people to read it so they can make up their own minds about whether the context and the evidence presented is, is persuasive or not. That's well, why I do it. Yeah. Let's focus on a, on a particular, a couple of particular problems. Orphan works. What we, let's assuming now that you are the leader, and you've been given charge of a project to do something about orphan works. Stage one would be to say, is there a problem? Right. And let's assume the evidence comes back from the BBC and the National Archive and other people saying there certainly is. Okay. So now, how do we fix it? Right. So the first thing is to figure out how the problem was created. Right. And in, in many discussions, there is sort of a agreement that there is a problem, but without really politely discussing what it is. So I'll, I'll give you an example that has nothing to do with copyright. So in Connecticut, the state where I live, um, we have public schools, and the public schools have an obligation to provide what's called a free and adequate education. And the term adequate here means that the kids who are going to be instructed will be instructed in an environment in which they can learn at levels where you might be able to quantify it based upon standard tests. Right? Now there are children who have special needs and those children either have to have special attention in, a, in that class or they have to go to another school for example, a private school, in which they can get the adequate education to which they're legally entitled. Now, the amount of money that's spent on private school tutoring for these kids is much greater than it is for the public schools, of course. 
the amount of budget that schools have been allocating to special education has increased dramatically since 2008. And you look at graph charts and you can see how it's gone up. And the school districts are very upset about this because budgets are very tight and they want to clamp down on special education expenses. We have a special education problem. But lost in that is any discussion of why it's increased. So I have no idea how they're ever going to solve the budgetary problem for special education if they won't honestly face the issue of why the numbers are going up. Are there more kids who need special education because they have problems starting in 2008 that they didn't have in 2007? You know, you have to figure that out. You can't just say expenses are going up, we have a problem, without figuring out why we have a problem. And that's the way orphan works are usually dealt with. Oh, we have an orphan works problem. Well, that's like special education. Why do we have an orphan works problem? To me, the reason we have an orphan works problem is that we have an automatic system of copyright where everybody gets copyright for everything they do, whether they know it or not, as you're mentioning for business letters, whether they want it or not, whether they care about it or not, whether they're ever going to exploit it or not. There's no formalities that can sort these things out. The wonderful thing about formalities, mandatory notice and renewal, is that it did have the impact of separating out the wheat from the chaff. It did have the impact of requiring people who wanted protection to take some steps to say, yes, we want it. And only in a religious ideological environment would you say, we don't want people to say, yes, I want this benefit. But we as the government are going to give it to you whether you want it or not. And indeed, it's, it's religiously inappropriate to say you should have this benefit. I'm using religious here in the ideological French sense that, you know, no right is more peculiarly somebody's than the right to their intellectual labor. It's a natural right. It existed, Rousseau, in the social contract. And the only obligation of parliaments are to confirm what already exists. Right? That, that sort of religious view on things. For the rest of us in common law countries who regard this as an important economic right, you know, it's not a violative of ideological you know, fervor to say, we're going to give you this economic benefit because we think it's of use to society, but we're going to ask you to say, I actually want the benefit, or I, I continue to want the benefit. That's not impolite. It's, you know, it's something right, well, that let, you let's can assume, do. Let's assume, you know, I, I, I have a lot of sympathy with it, that, that uh, some sort of registration system... Right. Then um, you don't have an orphan works problem. No, then we, the United States, did not have an orphan works problem under our old system. Right. Let's, let's assume we are, we're starting from here. Right. We've all signed up to the Berne Convention. Right. How do we get out of it? Right. <laughs> yeah, so you have to abrogate it. There are procedures by which, you, by which you can withdraw from the Berne Convention. It's not realistic, is it? It's not realistic. And the, and the other reason it's not realistic is that our trade negotiators have been doing everything they can to make sure that we will never be realistic. <laughs> right? Because the more times you commit yourself as a government to not changing your law, the less ability you have to change it. And you know, if, if you look at yourself, say outside of copyright, you look at yourself as a parent perhaps, in which you make mistakes with your children because it's the way you do it. The wonderful thing is that you want to be able to say to them, I'll do better next time, or I should have done this, or you can take a spouse, whatever it is, any human relationship where you make a mistake. The beautiful thing is to be able to go back the next day and do it better, do it differently. That That's, you know, one of, the, one, of the, one of the things we all want the ability to do is to correct a mistake. And you should want that for laws too. How, how unfortunate it is to have laws that you can realize are a mistake but never be able to change them. How unfortunate it is to have a situation where that ability to correct mistakes is in fact being taken away constantly. And, and so we as the United States have been doing that. We go around and bilateral agreements, free trade agreements. ACTA was one of these things. Perhaps the Trans-Pacific Partnership are another one of these things where we're trying to take away 
our ability to change law. So, so the first thing I would say is stop taking away the ability to change stuff. Now beyond that, if you say realistically, well, we're too far. You know, you joined the European Union, you know, maybe you're happy you didn't join the monetary part of it or not, who knows, um, for you to decide. Um, but you joined the IP part of it and you're stuck with it. And we're never going to, you're never going to yeah, be able to get it. And it's got a lot of French influence in it and, and the consequence is we are going to be stuck with burn unregistered rights. Right. To go back to the trade thing for a second, you know, making copyright a trade thing is, is a serious issue because you have other benefits. Right? So let's say we decide, oh, you know, th these trade agreements we when entered into, like GATT or other things, that was a big mistake. We're going to get out of them. The agricultural industries, the service industries, no way. They're going to say, hey, you made a mistake? That's too bad. I'm not giving up my benefits. Right? That, that's a serious problem. So that's why it's better not to get in that bind in the first place. Having gotten into it, then you figure out, well, what do you do when I can't fix the actual problem, when I can't make things better in the sense of starting from scratch and doing it right. You know, that's never a good situation to be in, where you've made so many mistakes that you can't ever correct what the real problem is. You're left a bit at the margin. So one thing you can do, and, and we discussed this, is on the remedy side. One issue for orphan works that, you know, anybody who has a project of any size is worried about is getting enjoined. Most people, I think, if you limited the remedy to the actual licensing fees or damages that are lost, and no one's saying somebody shouldn't be compensated for use, um, would say that that would be fine. But it's really the injunctive relief that's one of the great killers. So if you had a regime where you say, you can use orphan works, maybe you set aside money or not, However that plays out, you don't get statutory damages as we have in the United States, you get licensing fees. You know, that's one thing you can do. But the injunction, you know, from where I sit, and, I, and I'm not representing Google in this, um, but from where I sit as a person, you know, the ability not to have injunctive relief would, would be a significant thing you could do. That is, I think. And then, let's suppose you've got an orphan work, you did a, a reasonable digit search, couldn't find anybody, right. depending on the, the reasonably diligent depends on, on what you wanted to do with it. It's a picture of the vicar when he was a baby at the, at the, at the summer, sh summer fair, that's one thing. You, know, you pick out which one is the vicar, uh, uh, um, that's one thing. Uh, None of us really have had to worry about that, I think. Right? <laughs> Um, but if you want to use it, on, 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 <laughs> you want to use it, on, the BBC want to exploit it and actually right. send something up, which they years and years ago, and they have no idea now who owns the copyright. They've got to do a bit more of a search, because uh, right. proof that it is an orphan. So right. you have a, a sort of test, which depends on what the use you want to make. And then, if you've done that, you say no injunction. And possibly not even a wrong. Because it's still, if somebody sues you for infringement, would you say that it's... And the judge says, well, I have to assess damages. Or would it go off to the tribunal? Would that be a route you could go? Right. So you could go off to a tribunal, I guess. I mean, there, there has to be a concept that not every use is an infringing use. Mm -hmm. right. So there, there is, obviously, you have fair dealing, we, we have fair use. And, and so the ability to say that a particular use, and perhaps your vicar one, would be a fair dealing use um, is okay too. The, one of the criticisms for fair use that some people have made is that it's merely the ability to hire a lawyer, right? <laughs> because you don't know. I mean, when I was in private practice, I litigated a number of fair use cases, and the ones I won, of course, thought I should have won. The ones I lost, I thought the judges were wrong. <laughs> it may surprise you. Um, and the, certainly the ones I lost, the client thought the, the judges the other way wrong. around, the old lawyer retiring. Mm -hmm. And he said, what did you think of the legal system? And he says, I think it's not so bad. He said, I, I won the cases I should have lost, and I lost the cases I should have won. So on the whole, justice was done. Ah. <laughs> right, right. We have, to, we have to, at least at the commercial reality, if you lose the case, the client thinks that you should have won it and the judge should have gone you know, the other way. But it is something that's ad hoc because it's, it's a fact issue, right? So you can't actually build a business. It's difficult, at least, to build a business of any exposure based entirely on, on fair use. So that's why you need to have other things that would limit 
possible damages because of the commercial insurance. If you want to have orphan works legislation that's limited only to tiny, small, non-commercial uh, endeavors, you could do that, but you're not really accomplishing very much. It's like having a decaf espresso. You know, I don't understand that at all. <laughs> I once ordered a double decaf in Australia, and the, the girl came up and she said, here's your oxymoron. <laughs> Right. In the United States, we call them "why bother?" <laughs> yeah. uh, so, another question is: is, is we've discussed that you touched upon it already? It's already gone down the road an awful long way, and you suggest the wrong road, or several wrong roads at the same time. Right. Um, is, are the fixes going to have to be of all kinds? Not coming back up the road, because you can't do that, but doing something about the fact you've gone down the wrong road. Right. Would that be the well, general view so, you, you take? Mm -hmm. So I think the Hargraves Review really did an, an exceptional job of figuring out what things you could do to make the road better. And, and you have limitations in ways that we don't. So then those limitations obviously are, are EU directed. You know, we don't have those. So you could figure out for example, in fair dealing, that you have certain flexibilities that you're permitted to do and certain things that you're not. And then for those things that you can't do because of EU directives, then you have to go lobby at the EU level to have those things changed. So those, those are sort of different ones, but I thought the Hargraves review and the government response was both candid, realistic, and helpful in figuring out where those things were. I don't know why it's only the British government have started worrying about this, whereas nobody seems to be worrying about it in France or Germany or, or your country or China or anywhere. Yeah. Well, can you have you any clue why only the Brits have got excited about this? So I think you know you've managed to get other people excited. You've got the Irish excited. I hear the Australians are excited. Well, that's so you know I I would say you know keep up the excitement and you might get others on board. Korea has totally a fair use provision. Um, but one, one, one difference, of course, I think you, you experienced this um, in Germany, was the, the framework <coughs> in which people think about issues. Um, and, and that's a significant problem. So one of the reasons that I actually wrote this particular book is to try to figure out all of the mistakes I've made in the last 30 years. Right, so if you've been doing things for some period of time, I think you become your own worst enemy. And you become your own worst enemy by believing things to be true that maybe were never true, or that were true then but aren't true anymore. And it's very difficult to think outside of yourself. Maybe it's impossible to do. But it's a good thing to try, to think outside of yourself and to figure out whether you did things wrong. Uh, I, I, have you ever met Judge Laval? I know we spoke about him. But, but, so one of my friends is the Second Circuit Judge, Judge Pierre Laval. And he once told me that the best way to know you have a mind is to change it. <laughs> <laughs> you might otherwise not actually be thinking. So I've always thought if people tell me that I've got things wrong, that's a wonderful thing. Because I have at least the opportunity to understand things that I thought I understood that I didn't. And that's a wonderful exercise to undertake. If you believe that you understand everything, if you believe that you're right and the other person is wrong, then you don't undergo that effort. So it may be that other countries have a certain ideology or a certain approach that fits for them, and maybe they don't think they need to change. Or maybe they're not thinking. That's yeah, possible. I, I found that it, when I sat at the Copyright Tribunal, fixing or refixing the rate for using music on recordings, so it was the record companies versus the publishers. Um, and the publishers said, well, look, among other things, that the rate in France is 10%. And the rate that the publishers are asking for here, the, 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 the record companies are asking for is 8% exactly equivalent of what they'd always been paying. Mm -hmm. uh, and qu quite an interesting thing was, you ask yourself, well, which is the more successful industry? 
the British record industry or the French record industry. <laughs> now, that would be evidence-based, I don't know. But uh, and we settled for the 8% because we thought the British record industry was doing quite well. Uh, uh, and that's basically why we did it. Um, but you could never persuade the French to bring it down to 8% because their industry might be better off. Mm -hmm. I mean, aren't we up against what you call religious no, problems here? I, I think so. I mean, my father's French-Canadian, which is a different beast, <laughs> I, I would say. And, and you know, it, it's, it's very hard to have a discussion with people who think they're right and they don't need to change. Maybe they don't. I mean, maybe it works perfectly well for them. Um, but, you know, they're the ones that sort of decide that. For myself, that, that's just my approach, is, is to figure out the ways in which I've made mistakes. I'm not interested in people telling me the ways that I'm right. I mean, it's nice to hear and sort of, you know, a good thing. But if, my, if, if you want to make progress, then you have to figure out the ways that you're wrong. That's just my own personal way of doing things. Now, I want to ask you a different problem, which is this. Let's assume we have a lot more things come out of copyright. Lots of things are. I told you it earlier. I bought my son a Kindle. He didn't buy any books. He just downloaded free stuff, out of copyright stuff. I suspect quite a lot of other people have done the same. And the question I'm going to ask you is, is, is are we moving towards a, pit, a point where we're having a serious problem of the dead competing with the living? <laughs> Uh, and the living wants some money to live off, and the dead don't. Uh, well, I don't know why that's an unfair, you know, dispute. You know, one one would hope that that the the living could at least have a fighting chance of of proving that you should buy their works over the dead. Well, <laughs> you see, recorded music, <coughs> the quality of recordings was rubbish for quite a long time, but we've now got to the point where the recordings made, uh, and you, uh, some people sort of cheat and say, well, digitally remastering creates a new copyright. Put that on one side for the moment. Right. The actual recordings at the time, say in the 50s, were really quite good. So you don't need to do any digital remastering. And they were running out of copyright. Mm -hmm. uh, and potentially other recorded music of all kinds was running out of copyright. And people could buy records without paying any copyright royalties to anybody. Okay. And is that bad? Well, is it a problem for those who want to create new works? Why? So let's or take should examples you not create a perpetual copyright? Right. So let's give the examples that we talked about. So you have two competing recordings um, of, of a composition. Pick, pick the classical recording you want. Of, of, a, of a public domain work. Klemperer versus, versus Rattle. Okay, right. So I would hope that Sir Simon could make the case why you should, if you have to choose, right? And, and of course the assumption is you have to choose and you actually don't. You can have both. And, and most people do have both. Uh, but assuming you have to choose either because you only have a certain amount of money or, or for whatever reason you have to choose, you know, I would want Sir Simon, especially since he's in Berlin now, right, to be able to say, by me, and not by Klemperer. You know, and if he can't make that case, I would say, too bad for him. So, how would you get me? He, he did a pretty good job of that when he was in Birmingham, right? I think people were, <laughs> were buying, a lot of his, <laughs> buying a lot of his records. But it does go to an to a, a, a underlying question there, I think. So, if you take... A, a public domain recording and you have a choice between buying a public domain recording of something and buying a recording that's under copyright. How are you going to make that decision? You may say it's under price, but the price for public domain works is not always less than it is for works that are under copyright. You know, it, it may be a bit less uh, or not. So the issue is, as a consumer, how is, is value created for you? And I would say, at least in the hypo that you're giving, the value has nothing to do with copyright at all. You know, I personally, and I'm an avid consumer of things. I, I buy tons of books and records and sheet music and, 
and stuff like that. So I may not be a typical consumer, but I'm at least a, a promiscuous consumer. Um, I've never bought or not bought something based upon whether it's under copyright. It's like, in my entire life, that's never been an issue. I buy it because it has value for me. And there's sometimes a false equation that copyright actually creates value. It may protect value that's established otherwise. And that's a very important role. And it's not to diminish it in the least. It's in fact, to me, the most critical role for copyright to play. Um, but it doesn't create value at all. What creates value is people's ability and willingness to buy things. So, you know, take my house. This is not the Henny Youngman joke, take my wife, please. It's my wife. <laughs> so, so, we bought our house 10 years ago. If we were to sell it today, we would have to sell it at a 25% loss, simply because that's the way the housing market in the United States is. Now, I may say, my house is actually worth more than what I paid for, because we've made you know, uh, a lot of improvements and stuff like that. You know, it does me no good. I can't say to somebody who wants to buy, you know, this house isn't actually, I'm not going to sell it to you for 25% less, I'm going to sell it for you 25% more. You know, too bad. <laughs> It doesn't matter. The value that I put on something, at least in an economic transaction, we're talking about copyrighted commodities, the value is established otherwise. And so Sir Simon, I think, has to compete in that commodity market. And you know, I actually think he can do quite well. He can. Yeah. <laughs> now, where do you see copyright in 15 years, 20 years' time? Oh, you know, I have no idea. Um, I grew up in Northern California um, in the 1960s and there were an amazing number of futurists and people like that and I, I always despised them. Uh, <laughs> you know, I have enough trouble figuring out the present um, and making sense of that. So I, I really have no, no idea where it will be. My hope is, this has nothing to do with where it will be, of course, because I have no idea. My hope is that it's better aligned to what people's expectations of it are. And my real hope would be, actually, that no one actually talks about copyright anymore. To the extent that we talk about copyright, we talk about it because it's a big problem. Right. I would think for the copyright industries, what they want is people not to be talking about copyright. What they want is for people to be saying, you know, that's a really great product. I really want as much of it as I can get. To me, that's actually success. To the extent that you're talking about the difficulties with copyright, you're talking about people's dissatisfactions. So I, my, my dream would be for business models and laws to match what consumers' expectations are. And I'm not saying that if your expectation is I should get everything for free, that that's a reasonable expectation. You know, it's not. But I actually don't think that most people want things for free. So to me, that's, that's sort of a red herring. Yeah, I suppose that's going back to what copyright was in the 60s when I came to the bar. There was only one barrister who really did copyright. Mm -hmm. He didn't do much. Well, so, 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 to, so to, to sort of to test your, your idea about, about the inability to tell where things are going to be. So I've been with Google five years and five months. I joined October 5th, 2006. And it took me 11 months to get hired, not only because Google was very slow in hiring people, but because Google, was the person who was hiring me, my boss at the time, was totally unconvinced that there would be enough to keep one person busy doing copyright full time. <laughs> right. So, well. Futures can have their way, but I'm not one of them. No, we're very sensible. Right, and Bill, there's drinks upstairs, and I think we should all go up there. And you can all go and talk to Bill, because he's very talkable too, and he talks at you in the most interesting way. Right, and thank very you very funny. much for coming, Bill. Thank everyone for coming, and we're <laughs> happy to continue. Thank you for having us. Thank you very much.